The first question I guess before I even speak to Ron Noble is why is he here? Why, why did I invite him in the first place? Because this is after all a conference, a summit on sport and business. That's the reason, because to me, at the end of this long road, the, the marriage between sport and business, there is no business down the end of the road if we allow sport to become so corrupted that people can't believe in its credibility. And I think the, the very place we're in, Istanbul at this moment, with half the, the football hierarchy locked up or at least facing <coughs> some kind of trial, that sort of puts us right in, in the mouth of where, where we're at. But <coughs> to introduce Ron Noble, if it's necessary, <coughs> he, is, he was a chief prosecutor for the American government in real crime. And, you know, we're talking mafia, we're talking terrorism, we're talking everything. So when we first introduced one another, I said to him, well, where does sport come on this priority? How, how does sport gain your attention? After having a dinner, dinner with him, I knew where. The guy is a sports fan, like I would imagine at least two-thirds of the people in the room, even if we're here for business, even if it's a job. Sport is so compelling, and anyone who saw Chelsea steal the game from Barcelona last night will know what I mean. So really, without much more ado, except to say that, in case you don't know, Ron Noble has been for 11 years Secretary General, which is effectively the Chief Officer of Inter Interpol, which is the International Police Force Liaison with police forces in 190 countries around the world. So I doubt that we could have a, a better guest to discuss the situation we're talking about now. And I don't intend this to be a rigid interview. This will be a discussion between the two and we'll go where it leads. <clears throat> but I will start by saying, Ron, during the World Cup two years ago, what was the scale of corruption that your officers were investigating? For I'm asked frequently, what is the sort of scope of the illegal betting problem in football or in sports generally? And you can read numbers that say anywhere from 90 billion a year to Chris Eaton, a former colleague, has said up to 500 billion a year. For me, it's hard to project the scope globally, except to say it's huge and to give you some concrete examples drawing on the question that Rob just asked me. For the uh, World Cup 2010, during four weeks, Interpol organized a joint operation with six countries in Southeast Asia. Okay? Four weeks. And in those four weeks, there were over 5,000 arrests, 5,000 arrest, 5, arrests in the, in the six countries, 2,000 raids, and over hundreds of billions of dollars Hundreds of, billions, hundreds of millions of dollars in illegal betting. We did those operations three times since 2007. Since 2007, we've had three operations where the arrests alone were almost 7,000, almost 7,000, more than 2,000 raids, and illegal bets seized in the amount of 2.239 billion euros. That's six countries, Three operations, a total of 12 weeks, to give you an idea of how large a problem it is. A few months ago, there was a match between Lyon and uh, Dynamo Zagreb, I believe, where Lyon won 7 to 1. 7 to 1. After having not scored a goal in the previous three matches. And, and afterwards, the feeling of many, and an article written by you, made us all question whether the result was a great result based on the great athleticism and the commitment of the Lyon team or whether it was based on corruption. I believe that's the real problem that corruption in sports brings to us is that we can't have confidence that a great result um, is in fact a great result. We ask ourselves, I wonder whether in fact it was a result based on the merit or based on something else. <clears throat> Once you take <clears throat> the head criminals of these syndicates out of commission, how soon is it before the problem mushrooms itself and reinvents itself? You know, the parallel between illegal sports betting and drug trafficking is very, very strong. 
Unfortunately, when these arrests and raids occur, typically it's the people on the lower rungs who are arrested. And the goal is you arrest them, you get them to cooperate, or you convict them at trial, and then you ask them to give you information about the people higher up. So when I say 6,000, almost 7,000 arrests and three operations, for the most part, low-level people or people operating small gambling dens, and we're still moving up the chain to get to the transnational organized crime figures behind and it. Is, is it a question of arrest? I mean, if you get a gang that's organized <clears throat> criminality at such an event as the World Cup, if, if you can put that gang into jail, or not you, because the one thing that I think not too many people understand is that Interpol doesn't actually arrest anybody. Interpol is like a liaison between police forces, gives the police forces the information. I've been to <coughs> Lyon, to the headquarters there, and it's, it's as though you're walking into the future. There's a room maybe this big, full of consoles with people who are multilinguists looking at this information as it comes in. This is not sports fraud they're looking at. They're looking at everything from millions of conf or stolen or lost passports to, and you can imagine again what this means for the upcoming Olympics. Because if England or London has a problem with the Olympics, and if the problem is who's coming in, then somebody has to have a database to stop those people coming in. And even the police forces that I've spoken to around the world are not that willing and not that ready to plug into Ron's database in Lyon. Yeah. Well, I mean, your, your question raises a, a good point, and that is sort of who's behind a lot of this illegal gambling and sports betting that occurs? Most of us have friends or family members who've made bets on important sporting matches, not even knowing whether they're legal bets or illegal bets, but they've made bets on matches. But what most people don't understand is a lot of these transnational organized crime groups that organize these betting operations, they organize the collection of bets, the losing bets. And the collection techniques um, tend to really follow a lot of the collection techniques that you will see in the movies. Either threats of harm or physical harm or threats of harm or physical harm to loved ones. So when Interpol gets focused on these operations, you know, we, we have to make arrests, we have to conduct raids, but our goal is to get up the chain to take down these transnational organized crime groups that are preparing themselves for the Olympics, that are preparing themselves for the, are already participating in the Champions League, and that, that are really not innocent groups of people just trying to allow other innocent groups of people to make a bet. And then something you said to me <coughs> when I first visited Leon is, this is 24-7 that, that you work, but when you arrived at Interpol only 11 years ago, it was like nine to four, and everybody put their raincoats on and went home. And what kind of staff around the world can you organize to, to try to beat organized crime? Uh, organized sporting crime, since yeah. that's where we're. For, for us um, at Interpol, we, we try to do things in very basic ways, but to do sort of basic or ordinary things in extraordinary ways. So when you ask how do we try to fight um, a crime like this, we, we recognize that all international crime is really local crime somewhere. There's some community where there's someone engaged in criminal conduct or encouraging criminal conduct or hurting people or threatening to hurt people. And what you try to do is, is mobilize the police in those countries and the civil society in those countries to care. And the only way to, to get them to care is to have it become emotional in some way, have them be able to identify to some wrong that was done to a friend of theirs or even to their favorite team because of passion for sports that many of us feel, even those of us who are introduced as lovers of sports and at one time remember ourselves as athletes, um, that, that uh, it really, really matters at the local Should level. Say this, this guy was in the gym at 7 o'clock this morning. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> are you uneasy? Uh, I mean, maybe it is my suspicious journalistic nature, but are you uneasy about the level to which top clubs, Real Madrid, if I dare mention it, wear on their vests? advertising for internet betting. Because the, the, the whole of sport now seems to be so much in bed with, with betting as an organization, that is it any surprise then that they're squealing that you, you know, corruptors have, have spoiled their, their beautiful game? I hope I'll have a job after I answer this question. <laughs> but I don't 
see anything wrong with legal betting. And I believe that legal betting challenges activity in a way that it can be re regulated. So the fact that a team is wearing something saying bet legally, uh, I would encourage that kind of activity. But it's different in the States. You know, a lot of things are different. <laughs> a lot of things are different in the US. Um, in, in the US, if I might say so, I hope this is accurate, there are some states or some geographic locations that have monopolies or close to monopolies on gambling. Um, but in the US, there are many, many, many legal ways to bet. But we're a diverse world. Interpol has 190 member countries, and that's another problem I just want to highlight for you. Imagine you have a large, large, large bet on a match. And the match says, you know, you're going to win so long as the aggregate score uh, isn't more than four goals scored. And let's say by the first half, it's 3-2. And if the game finishes the way it's going, you're going to lose your money. But imagine you can stop the match. You can talk about examples from the UK. You can stop the match and not pay anything. The influence or encouragement for you to stop the match would be great. Imagine you're now in another jurisdiction where once you reach halftime, the bets are paid out. So one of the, one of the problems that exists, and it's just going to be there around, is you've got in, incoherent rules affecting when bets are paid and when bets are not paid. It's not going to change, but at least by being aware of it, if suddenly the lights go out in a stadium or something unusual happens and a match is stopped, then you can understand, let's look in this betting jurisdiction where if something happens before the halftime or at a certain point, the match, all bets are cut off, called off, or if it continues. And that's why you can't use one country as an example. You can't have the best law enforcement agency in one country or the best team in one country because there are people all over the world finding creative ways to encourage sometimes innocent athletes to say, you know, my friend and I uh, have this bet, this friendly bet that the first, cor the first corner is going to come from um, the other team. Can you make it happen? You know, just, we'll laugh about it afterwards. I mean, things like that happen. It sounds, you might think that it sounds naive, but it happens. And people do it for friends or for family members whom they trust. And at the same time, there's a huge amount of money um, at stake. So that's why you know, Interpol's approach when we entered into this agreement with FIFA was to say, you know, we're good at uh, investigating people and helping our member countries investigate. We're good at tracking down criminals wherever they go internationally. But we want to be better at helping crime be prevented in sports where once it happens, once the bad taste is on your mouth, you can never remove it. Let us explain what your agreement is with FIFA. Because it, it is actually an educational um, plan that, that Interpol is putting into place. I'll tell you how it happened. Um, we monitor the internet in a variety of languages on a daily basis, looking for usually terrorist-related activity or, or suspicious activity. And we learned about the scandal that was surrounding FIFA. The sense was that there was corruption um, within FIFA, within the sport, and not enough was being done to combat it. So the former head of Interpol's Command and Coordination Center, a 24-7 operation, an Australian police officer, um, w had just been hired by FIFA to be the head of security. So I contacted him and I said, listen, Interpol's prepared to try to develop a training capacity building program for civil society and for law enforcement around the world on the condition that you give us the money and we decide how to spend it. And uh, we had discussions with FIFA Secretary General and FIFA President, and, and they agreed to it. And that's the agreement we have now, is where we're in the process of building, it's over a 10-year period, a comprehensive program to try to teach people about how corrupt activities occur, to try to educate a lot of these young athletes at various levels, and managers and officials, and to do it, you know, by training in, on location, around events, uh, e-learning, in academic institutions, wherever we can. But to and treat it as a long-term problem that unless you pay attention to it over a long period of time, it's going to you know, leap up one day and, and, and really shock you. And how deliberate is it that that complex is going to be based in Singapore, which is obviously Asia, and, and Asia is perceived as part of the genesis of the problems of illegal gambling? When Interpol is building a 
global complex in Southeast Asia, in Singapore. Historically, since we were born, we've been in Europe, and since 1946, we've been in France, where we have our headquarters in France. But so much activity, legal and illegal activity, is now going on in the rest of the world, and Interpol believed that it should have more than one axis or more than one global complex. So we decided to build a complex in Singapore. Sports, corruption in sports, or integrity in sports was not foremost in our mind. It was where could we be located, where there's a, a, a great infrastructure, where the corruption was low in the country, where we could fly in and fly out very easily, where the government would support an independent and neutral Interpol, and Singapore surfaced. Afterwards, afterwards, these stories where my former colleagues said that uh, Singapore was the academy of corruption or academy of corruption in football uh, uh, in the world. So now it, it's great that we're there because we're going we're gonna to put the, uh, the capacity building and training uh, unit there and it's going to be a FIFA supported area and there's going to be a lot of business um, in that part of the world to try to fight corruption but that wasn't the plan uh, initially. When this whole thing starts Obviously, you've got this contract. It's 20 million euros over 10 years. Which is, which is little. That, that's FIFA, FIFA's right. contribution. Right. What about other sports? Have you got across the threshold of cricket with, with the obvious problems that cricket's having right now? Even sumo wrestling. Yes, yes. My mother says in my work, I don't have to worry about a job because there's always some work to do. Um, but uh, we've already met with the International Cricket Council um, to talk about collaboration we can do. They actually have a very, very good training program there that Interpol can learn from, so we've already met with them. I've, I've not, uh, I'm going to Japan in a couple of weeks. So I've not thought about the sumo wrestling organization, but that's a, that's a possibility. Our program is broader than football. It's an integrity and in sports program. But one thing that Interpol generally believes, it's the local law enforcement, the local community knows best how to investigate crime for, or, or keep people safe. If you want to find the best way to secure a football match, Turkey. The police in Turkey, the citizens of Turkey, the private security in Turkey, they one of the best operations in the world in terms of how to secure um, a stadium um, for a match. It's my opinion as Interpol Secretary General. In terms of these other sports, if you mentioned the Olympics, you know, we're, we're, we're just building relationships and networks to make sure that we learn the best practices from various sports in terms of how to help all of us keep sport generally clean.